Hi, it's me, Tim Da, the Everyday Astronaut. I hope you guys can hear me and see me okay. I think you can. Uh, how are you guys? It's obviously been a little bit since I've been able to stream. I'm really excited for today's stream because this is something I've been waiting to see for almost three years now. So, yeah, this is this is a really good one. It's going to be honestly amazing. If you don't know why I'm excited, today, Rocket Lab is going to try to catch a rocket with a helicopter. And that's uh, that's about as ridiculous as it gets. That's that's up there to me with SpaceX trying to catch a rocket with some chopsticks on a tower. I mean, trying to catch a rocket with a helicopter is pretty absurd. But I think it's I think it's actually going to go really well. I, they've been practicing a lot. Uh, I've done videos on why exactly you know how exactly they're going to do this and the physics behind it. You know how feasible is it? Uh, keeping in mind that of course the you know for instance the United States. Um, had these Corona spy satellites and were recovering about, they re successfully recovered like 75% of Corona spy satellite images from space via parachute and air recovery with a, with a plane. So if they can do it, yeah, <laughs> I, I think, I think we can do it today. So, all right, guys, um, let's go ahead and, um, oh, so yeah, if, for those of you that are curious why I'm in Texas right now, you'll learn why in a little bit. It's actually not, probably not as exciting as some of you think, but some of you in Discord and Patreon know probably why I'm down in Texas. Uh, but I'm excited because I'm going to be able to meet some of my favorite 3D creators like Casper Stanley and a whole group of awesome pe individuals that are out here at Starbase this week, so it's going to be super fun. Um, but all right, let's let's dive into why exactly uh, this, is, this is so exciting. And we're going to start off by doing uh, by going to a certain website called everydayastronaut.com and we're going to go through the pre-launch preview. And you can do this, you can go to any of these by clicking on, on everydayastronaut.com and clicking on upcoming launches. You'll see our list of upcoming launches. Now this particular launch is called There and Back Again uh, and it is a electron launch. So this is going to be taking off today, uh, May 2nd here, at least in the United States um, at 22 UTC. That's going to be for me, 542 uh, Central. Um, or 41, I guess. I probably need to change that for some reason. I thought it was 42. I'll fix the clock. Actually, I'm gonna just take the clock down as soon as their thing goes up. I think that's the right thing to do. Uh, so the mission name, like I mentioned, is there and back again. It's a commercial rideshare mission. The launch provider, the company doing this mission is Rocket Lab. The customers for this, there's a handful. There's Alba Orbital, um, Asterix, Astronautics, Aurora Propulsion Technologies, eSpace, Unseen Labs, and Swarm Technologies. Uh, the rocket for this mission is, of course, their Electron rocket. That's currently the only rocket that, that Rocket Lab has, although they are, of course, working on their Neutron rocket as well. The launch location. This is taking off from launch com the OG launch location, Launch Complex 1A from the Mahia Peninsula in New Zealand. Uh, so this is obviously... Uh, they're current, so the, currently they have three pads basically at two different locations. They have a pad in Wallops, Virginia, which has not been utilized yet, and they now have um, 1A and 1B. Uh, in, at Mahia. So this is the OG one. The payload mass, we don't exactly know how heavy it is, but you know, the Electron can fly up to about 300 kilograms these days uh, in certain configurations to low Earth orbit. But this one's going to sun synchronous, so it's probably more like 225 or so. Up to 225, but we don't know the exact payload uh, mass for this. The, where these satellites are going is up to a 520 kilometer sun synchronous orbit. So basically a polar orbit or near polar. Um, it's actually slightly more retrograde than a polar orbit, and that's always uh, pretty fun. Uh, will they be attempting to recover the first stage of their rocket? This is, uh, as far as full-blown non-water recovery, this is the first time that I can say yes. It'll be their first attempt at a full-blown mid-air recovery capture of the Electron rocket. So this very well, if this goes well, this could be the first Electron to refly. So just think about that. That's pretty darn cool. So. We'll see. We will see. All right. So, um, the where will the first stage land? It will be captured mid-air by the Sikorsky uh, S-92 helicopter that they uh, have rented or hired out for this particular flight for these particular missions. Um, will they be attempting to recover the fairings? No. So these are new fairings. That is not something that Rocket Lab has pursued or anyone else besides SpaceX has pursued, to my to my knowledge. How the weather? How's the weather? As of like an hour ago, they started loading prop about an hour ago. So it seems like uh, pretty darn good. This will be the first time that a helicopter will, clat will catch Electron's booster midair. This is the first at sea offload of a booster. So what they're doing for this mission in particular is they're going to take the, uh, the Electron and they're going to actually put it onto a recovery vessel for this first attempt. So a lot of things in this first attempt are more conservative, like, hey, let's make sure you know we can just get this booster back. Eventually they plan to just fly the helicopter out there, catch it and bring it all the way back to land. But for this particular flight, 
um, they're going to try to land it on a nearby vessel, a nearby sea vessel, just just to remove some complex complexity and give themselves plenty of margins for this particular mission. Um, this will be the third of Rocket Lab launch of 2022, so they're coming up. They're a little behind one a month, obviously, uh, as you can tell. They're about every other month, but I hope that that Rocket Lab steamroller is ready to go. This will be the 26th Electron launch, the 48th orbital launch attempt of 2022. So again, if you guys need to learn more about this mission, definitely read through this article. It's These articles, our, our website crew is amazing. Seriously, I read our own articles to catch up on the things going on in spaceflight, which is awesome because we have a whole incredible website crew that keeps everything up to date. Um, as you can imagine, I don't have time to do all of these on top of all the other things. So uh, this has been something, we've had a full-time website crew for almost, for over a year and a half, maybe almost two years now. Um, and it has totally been game changing because I now can rely on our website crew uh, to be able to do awesome things. So of course, check out our articles. Uh, anytime you wanna know anything about upcoming uh, rocket launches, but there's just a lot of cool images in here, a lot of nerdy info, like uh, some of the characteristics of this, uh, of the helicopter and everything. So very, very cool. Uh, the, the, uh, the takeoff weight, you'll notice that the weight and the takeoff weight, obviously, um, there's, there's I, this helicopter can easily handle this one ton rocket. So that's, that's really exciting. The rocket, when it's empty, is only about one ton because it's very lightweight carbon composites, very small engines. Um, yeah, so these, like I said, go ahead and read through this article. It is quite fantastic. This one was written by Maria. Uh, so everyone say thank you to Maria for doing all of this awesome work for all of us. It is greatly appreciated. So say thank you, Maria, in the chat. We have a good a good bit of time before Rocket Lab streams, hopefully, um, or at least that's my hope. Um, so I'm going to get this kind of ready to be pulled up here, and I'm going to catch up on some of your guys' questions and comments. Of course, as always, guys, don't worry about super chatting or any of that stuff is, of course, appreciated. But we pull up, we just take good comments from, from the community, from you guys, and, uh, and we put them up on air. So just ask a good relevant question. If our mods catch, catches one, there's a good chance you'll get on air. And uh, I, we just love answering questions that help everyone understand this stuff uh, much better. But we also have, a, we will also do a handful of thank yous to, to the people that do help support what we do here as well. So let's start off with um, a great question from, um, from our, our nude uh, Hubox says, uh, what are some of the risks in recovering Electron in this manner? Well, of course, the, the biggest risk, I think, is, is obviously just the fact that you have, you know, two dynamic vehicles. You have a, a helicopter flying that has its own, you know, has its own rotor wash and a lot of uh, a lot of turbulence, a lot of wind and all of these characteristics of flying a helicopter anyway. You also have a rocket falling from space that, you know, has to survive re-entry. Um, there's always a small chance that, you know, if it would get out of control or something, it could turn into a million pieces of debris, um, in which case they're going to... Uh, you know, obviously you have to just zip out of there as quickly as possible with the helicopter and make sure all personnel are safe. So, you know, there, there is a chance that, you know, parachutes don't deploy or something. Um, so they want to make sure the hel that, the, that the booster is completely under parachute control and safe descent before humans get too close to it. Because that is, ultimately, you, don't, you do have a giant, uh, relatively big uh, projectile, you know, falling from space. So until it's in a controlled, safe manner, the biggest risk is that is anyone nearby. So I'm sure they have a lot of uh, margins of safety, a lot of distance and, and things involved until it's you know under parachute control. And they have several minutes. I don't remember what it was. I don't remember if Peter Beck said it was like ten minutes or something. It's it's a long time that that parachute is that the parachute is actually uh, holding the booster up. So um, yeah, pretty pretty awesome stuff. So. All right, the, uh, we have some new members we need to thank, like Neo Vays, as well as XTC. Thank you guys for becoming a member. Don't forget, members, you guys do get to get sneak peeks to upcoming videos. I always use members and Patreon members as a way to be able to fact check and double check uh, the edits of any videos. So that's kind of a good way to get a sneak peek. The fun thing too, I, I've had people that have been around long enough that they'll watch the edit, the first edit, like the full draft, and then they'll get to see the final product and they'll realize how many changes we make from the feedback of those first videos, the first ones that we post to the ones that ended up on, on YouTube. I mean, especially this last video we just made um, about rocket engine cycles. Holy cow, did we make a lot of changes. Like I, th I think I did another like 50 voiceover changes or something between 
the final draft that, that all of the YouTube members and the Patreon members saw versus the one that was online. So it is really fun. That's a good time to get your feedback heard and make sure that you know these videos are as accurate as possible and as fun as possible. So uh, thank you to the YouTube members and everyone that helps make this possible. Speaking of making it possible, their Rocket Lab live stream is, has just appeared. So I'm gonna pull this up full screen. Um, I don't currently hear audio from them. Hopefully that's nothing on my end. Um, let me get this ready so you guys can see it as well. Um, and then of course, once we know the exact T minus time, I will switch it to uh, make it so they are the loudest thing. But currently I don't actually hear them, their audio. So hopefully, again, that's not on me. Um, I'm sure I'll show up. Okay, let's keep answering a few more questions here from everybody. This is from our friend Musical Wolves. Musical Wolves, how are you? Thank you for always having good questions. I, I don't know how Musical Wolves, you're I think the ultimate question asker because you always have really good questions that I haven't thought of yet. Was anything special needed to be done to the helicopter for it to support the weight of the boosters and still fly? Okay, we are getting a little bit of audio from them. That is great news. Um, as far as I'm concerned, no, it's mostly a, a, a a bone stock uh, Sikorsky S92. Uh, I, again, I don't quite remember its exact lifting capacity, but you know these helicopters are used often. These ones are, are pretty common for like sea rescue missions and things like that. They have a pretty healthy uh, payload capacity. So um, yeah, it's uh, I, again I don't know the exact specs on it or anything, but um, but I think for the most part they basically just have a a, a tow hook dangling off the bottom of the rocket or of, of the helicopter. And uh, I'm sure there's a lot more to it than that. I'm sure someone's out there screaming, being like, no, we had to support this and this. But I, I'm pretty sure the kind of the idea was get it to be as off the shelf helicopter as possible. Because of course, don't forget, uh, the Saturn V was proposed to be caught by a helicopter. Uh, that helicopter, technically, I don't know if it's really technically a helicopter. It's almost more like an auto gyro with jet tips. Um, because it wasn't, it's probably still a helicopter, but it had something like 100 meter wide rotors. Uh, it was going to be massive. You know, the world's like largest helicopter by a lot. Um, but of course that didn't end up working out, but when you think about, you know, trying to recover a, a vehicle as small as the Electron, having as small and, and simple and inexpensive to operate helicopter as possible, modifying it as little as possible is definitely advantageous. So yeah. Um, all right. This is from Corey Coster says, um, hi from, uh, from New Zealand, about 250 kilometers away from the launch site. Uh, weather is clear and calm here today. That's what we like to see. I love it. Boots on the ground, helping us know what the weather is like, setting hopefully good expectations for today's launch attempt. Um, yeah. This is from um, Thomas asking, please make better perks on YouTube. So the YouTube matches our, our Patreon um, support. Um, I don't know. I've just kept it simple. We can dive in and make all these crazy things on YouTube, but for the most part, I mean, the YouTube members, I just have one tier that matches the tiers of Patreon. Um, I don't know what to do. I, I could I could try matching a few more up to Patreon. The only thing is the YouTube member, the, the YouTube members, if, you, if you're trying to support a creator, which is obviously what, you know, us creators hope that you're attempting to do when, when uh, becoming a member of Patreon supporter is, um, Patreon takes something like 10%, YouTube takes like 30 or 40%. Um, so as far as like just feeding <laughs> the, the, uh, the algorithm and stuff, you know, it's, you're just really f feeding YouTube a lot, um, unfortunately. So yeah, um, but, but I, I could look into revamping it big time. So uh, Renau, how are you? Uh, this will hopefully be an epic launch. Good luck, Rocket Lab. Yes, we, I, I hope all of us are just as excited as I am because um, this could be a really big game-changing thing here for Rocket Lab. So, um, yeah, Rough Riders show. Um, do you still think they will? Do you think they will fly Electron after Neutron is online? Maybe. I, there's a chance that Neutron could really be. I mean, yes, I, I do think there is room to still to have a, a really inexpensive launch operation. If you can sell a flight for five million dollars at some point, even if it's not the best dollar per kilogram ratio launch, there is going to be demand for a rapidly. Uh, acceptable, you know, or, or rap, something that you can book quickly, get to your exact destination, and say it's either $5 million, you can get exactly where you want to go, or you have to ride share for $2 million. Uh, a lot of companies would actually go, we'll pay $5 million to go exactly where we want to go. That is actually a value. We'll get online quicker, we'll get better data, we'll have better visuals or whatever, we'll be in our exact orbit that we want to be in. So, um, okay, so it's before we even get too far here, uh, everyone, Holy cow, stop what you're doing. Say thank you to Andrew Green. Andrew Green, that is amazing. I haven't streamed in a very long time and 
Thank you very, very much. Uh, yeah, I just had quite... I can't wait for you guys to see the project. I'll probably start teasing some of it on Twitter this week. Um, again, Patreon and, and YouTube members probably know what I'm talking about, but we have a nice project down here in Texas that we're working on. Um, it'll be exciting for all of you watching because it is something for you, uh, not just for things here in Texas, but it's for you guys that watch my live streams anywhere. That's my clue. So, yeah, thank you very much, Andrew. You're, you're going to be helping very much with that. So I very, very, very much appreciate it. Another one from Andrew. No way. Thank you so much. Hang on. I met you at KSC at the first Falcon Heavy launch. Uh, we have three satellites going up today on Rocket Lab's launch. No way with my radar. That's crazy. What? Dude, that's awesome. Guys, Andrew's got a lot into this here today, so we'll be cheering extra for Andrew. Again, thank you so much. You really don't have to do. That is extremely, extremely generous. Uh, everyone just again say thank you, Andrew. Uh, that means the world to me and really helps pay the bills of, you know, things like this studio space that we haven't used in like nine months or a year. We really haven't used it in about a year. So uh, that wasn't quite what I thought was going to happen with this space, but this type of stuff certainly helps. So thank you so much, Andrew. Um, all right. So let's keep going here. There's probably a lot of and I'm, I'm going to try to get through as many of these questions as I can. So. Uh, you know, I will shut up once Rocket Lab starts starts talking. I'm going to do my best job to not o talk over them. Uh, and then I'll get back to as many questions as I possibly can as well. So um, this is from Sonderax. I like this. I don't care what, what Rocket Lab named this mission. I'm calling it Catch Me If You Can. I like that too. Um, this is from Eric Frazier celebrating 17 months of membership saying, let's catch this candle. Yes, I think we can. Let's, let's catch this candle? I like that. I 100% am ready for this. Uh, let's see here. This is from uh, Graf Spree. Ooh, they're starting. Um, also saying that they have uh, three months of membership. Hope it doesn't just smash the, the booster. I don't think they will. They've had a lot of time to practice this recovery, and I think it's going to go all really well, honestly. So this is going to be... This is going to be a fun one to watch. And like I said, once they fully get up going here, I'm going to basically shut up and I'm going to listen to them. I'm sure they're going to give us a lot of information. But again, um, oh, this is one last question. This is a good one. Are they going to get footage of, a, of the attempt? They are going to be attempting to, to show us live footage. Remember to have all the grace in the world if they can't because they're going to be trying to stream from the middle of the ocean on a helicopter. So if it doesn't work out, don't worry. We'll give them some patience. Um, they obviously get grace. So here we go. We're going to listen in here and see what they have to say because hopefully we'll learn a lot. This is going to be awesome. Hello and good morning from New Zealand where we are counting down to the liftoff of Rocket Lab's 26th Electron mission there and back again. You are looking at a live view of the rocket ready on the pad at Rocket Lab Launch Complex, Complex 1 on New Zealand's east coast from where we will fly 34 spacecraft to space for a range of customers on board this rideshare mission. It is uh, the 3rd of May here in New Zealand and we are about 20 minutes away from the opening of today's two hour launch window with T0 set for 10.41 a.m. local time. My name's Muriel Baker and I'm here at Rocket Lab's Mission Control Centre in Auckland, New Zealand to take you through the launch and our incredibly exciting secondary mission to catch a returning rocket booster from space with a helicopter. Today's launch will be the first time we try to bring back Electron's booster underneath a helicopter. It's all part of our plan to make Electron the world's first reusable orbital class small rocket, and this mission is the most advanced milestone in the program yet. We have live footage coming into Mission Control from the helicopter for today's catch, which we will bring to you throughout this broadcast as we have it, and you can see it on your screen there. Keep in mind, though, that considering how far out to sea the helicopter will be, the video feed could be patchy and inconsistent, so bear with us, and we'll bring you what we can. From about T plus eight minutes into the mission, we'll cross to the view from the helicopter as they attempt the catch. And regardless of whether we get those live shots, we will bring you updates throughout this broadcast on those operations as soon as we have them. 
It goes without saying, though, that catching a rocket mid-air with a helicopter is unconventional and multiple factors need to align perfectly for today's first attempt to be a success. When it comes to R&D, we aim for the best, but we also plan for the worst. And our backup option today is our recovery vessel, stationed at sea near the recovery zone and ready on standby to fish the booster from the ocean like on previous recovery missions if we needed to. Regardless of the outcome of today's recovery attempt, we will gather plenty of invaluable data to inform future attempts. We have recovered Electron's booster this way three times before on previous missions, where we used a parachute to slow Electron's first stage before landing it softly in the ocean to be retrieved by our recovery engineers from the vessel. Oh man. So one quick note on this, uh, of course the rocket looks uh, white and black on the bottom, but it's actually silver this time, and where it is white on the bottom, half underneath that red stripe, um, that is actually, uh, the, the white part is ice because of the liquid oxygen, uh, and the next part is actually, it looks black, but it's, it's a reflective silver, so um, they do have a, a light thermal coating on this rocket, very thin thermal coating. For this mission, we're not only going big on recovery, but we have also stacked Electron's payload plate with the most number of satellites we have manifested for a single mission. There and back again, we'll carry 34 satellites to a 520 kilometer circular Earth orbit, with payloads expected to begin deploying from Electron's kick stage at approximately T plus 53 minutes after liftoff. The first satellites to separate will be the three on board from eSpace in a demonstration of its technologies for its future sustainable satellite system. The satellites have small cross sections designed to decrease the risk of collisions with untrackable space objects and can automatically deorbit if any system malfunctions occur. Next will be the first of two stacks of Space Bees for Internet of Things Constellation Operator Swarm. Then we'll have the deployment of the Bro-6 satellite by Unseen Labs, a French company developing a constellation of satellites that detect radio frequency signals in marine mo monitoring. Today's mission is the third launch Rocket Lab has provided for Unseen Labs to expand this constellation. And then after Unseen Labs will come the Aurora Sat-1, also known as the Flying Object from Aurora Propulsion Technologies. This satellite will demonstrate space junk removal technologies for small satellites, including propulsion devices and plasma brakes that enable the sustainable use of space. Next will be the four PICO satellites from ALBA Orbital. This cluster of tiny spacecraft includes ALBA's Unicorn 2 Pocket Cube satellite, which carries an optical nighttime imaging payload designed to monitor light pollution across the globe. The other satellites are the TRSI-2, the TRSI-3, and a My Radar one Each of these small satellites carry a unique sensor designed to demonstrate innovative technologies on orbit. And then last but not least on the manifest is Copia from Asterix Astronautics, a technology demonstration that will remain attached to the kick stage as it tests its deployment system designed to improve on power restraints typically seen in small satellites. I love it. Yeah, there's a lot of satellites in that tiny little rocket. Let's delve a bit deeper, though, into today's recovery mission and how our operations will take place. This mission is the ultimate recovery test. While the team has simulated a mid-air recovery in the past, as I mentioned before, this is our first attempt at the real thing. The helicopter we'll use in today's operations is a Sikorsky S-92 helicopter, specifically modified with an auxiliary tank to allow for extra fuel to complete today's offshore mission. There you go. For anyone unfamiliar with this vehicle, it is a massive machine, roughly the size of a bus, normally used in search and rescue operations or to ferry large groups of people. The S-92 size and the power of its twin engines are being utilised today to manage the approximately one tonne weight of Electron's booster. The helicopter's capture zone is about 150 nautical miles off New Zealand's coast. The helicopter will wait in this area, a safe distance from where Electron is expected to return, before it attempts the catch. To do this, the S-92 is equipped with a long line with a capture hook that will be used to snag in Electron's parachute cable as it slowly descends over the ocean. To practice our rocket catching skills, we've carried out many mid-air capture tests prior to this mission. 
These were conducted by dropping an electron first stage test article from a second helicopter, deploying the stage's parachute and then using the S-92 to catch the stage as it descends. And I'm going to take you through a quick rundown also through the recovery process once today's mission leaves the pad. At about two and a half minutes after liftoff, Electron's first and second stages will separate like normal. Electron's second stage will continue on to orbit for payload deployment, while Electron's first stage will reorient itself and begin its descent back to Earth. It does this with tiny thrusters on the main body to tilt the first stage on the correct angle to slice through the atmosphere on the way back down. After deploying a drogue parachute at 13 kilometres or 8.3 miles altitude, the main parachute will be extracted at around 6 kilometres or 3.7 miles above Earth. This double deployment of chutes will help to dramatically slow the stage to a speed of just 36 kilometres or 22.3 miles per hour. This is expected to take place from about 8 minutes and 12 seconds in the mission. As the stage enters the capture zone, our helicopter will swoop in and rendezvous with the returning stage and capture it by its parachute line. And so as we approach the T-12 minute mark in this count to our launch, our operators on console will be run through the go-no-go no go poll by this mission's launch director, Joseph Carpico. This is the final assessment on whether all of Electron systems are go for launch and our operators are happy to proceed. Let's listen in to Mission Control and check in on how we are tracking for launch. So we'll see if they have anything on console and if they do, I will be quiet. But um, I did see someone real quick just had a comment like saying that it's dumb to capture, to try to catch this rocket with the helicopter. And to that I would say, if you had $3 million that's about to hit the ocean and be destroyed, and let's say you could, you think you could maybe catch it for even a million dollars, I think I'd like to make a million or two dollars in free hardware, basically. So, you know, that's the mindset. It's like, is it, uh, even if it's break even and they don't have to produce another rocket, uh, that's kind of Peter Beck's attitude. He said, you know, we don't even care about the economics of it. It's for us about not having to produce as many rockets as we want to fly. We can just capture them, bring them back. Yeah. So I think that's I think that's pretty cool. Right, LD, LD, so sounds like we're holding. Copy that. They're currently holding, which means there might be a little bit of a delay. Hopefully, not a full scrub. But we'll see. We'll have to wait. Yep, the clock has stopped. We'll wait. An update from the teams. And stand by for an update here shortly. All right, this is why I'm here to fill in the <laughs> fill in the gaps. <laughs> Let's see. Um, so it sounds oh. like we've got a hold in that go no go poll from our launch director. So we're going to stand by, listen in for more information from Mission Control, and wait for an update. Hopefully, it's nothing that totally uh, scrubs it for today, because based on my assessment, it does appear the pointy end is up and the, and the flamey end is down. So yeah, that's that's my checklist item. And as you guys know, if you watched when I covered Firefly's uh, stream, they actually had that in their checklist. So that made my year. Uh, I'll answer a few of these things like, uh, do we have a projected turnaround time for the boosters yet? I don't think anything's on the table yet uh, until they really get one in their hands that has not been touched down, that's in good shape. Uh, I don't even know if they'll refly this one. This might just be one that they kind of tear into. The LD on mission. Uh, please continue to monitor your critical systems and be prepared for a go-no-go no go on restarting of the count. Okay, so this stuff's pretty normal. I'm seeing a lot of good questions, so I'm going to keep trying to... Um, kind of on what I was just talking about, what are the chances this this Electron flies again? I have no idea. I don't think they really know uh, until they get it back and take a look at it and see if it's flight worthy, see if they need to be doing anything to recertify it to fly again. I think that's, I think that's the safe answer. Um, let's see here. This is a good question from Andrew. Uh, any updates on those awesome formal wear shirts? So we're working on shooting those here finally on model mid-May along with our um, upcoming Falcon 9 model rockets to our first production model rockets um, and a few other new things in the shop. Those will be shot in May and then up in the store soon after. So hopefully by the end of this month, I guess it is May. So hopefully by the end of this month, 
the that stuff will all be in the shop. Those are things that people have been asking for for a long time, and we're finally about to get them. So, um, yeah. Okay, so this is awesome from um, Ab uh, Abhalbire GHC. Hi, Tim. I translated parts of your cycle type article. Can we translate the EA website Those together? Those of you just joining us, uh, a quick note to let you know that we are in a hold at T minus 12 minutes to launch. We're standing by for an update from Mission Control, and as soon as we have that, we'll share that with you here. Cool. Um, so, uh, yeah, we'll, we will look for that email. That sounds awesome. I, we do really want, I just recently finally put up the Spanish translations from, from our most recent article, our most recent video. Uh, it would be cool someday if we had a tab and it had and actually had multiple languages. I think that would definitely fit within the realm of bringing space down to earth for everyday people. So uh, we will look for that. That sounds awesome. Um, this is from <clears throat> um, this is a great question from Waffle Flop. Why again? Remember, don't don't worry, guys. You don't have to super chat or anything. We try to pull just good questions to answer on air. So if you have a good question, uh, just say it, and one of our mods might throw it into the queue here. Uh, why is Rocket Lab planning to catch their booster after announcing they're almost fully reusable? Rocket, uh, the Neutron, that is, of course. Well, Neutron, at best, they're currently targeting 2024. So for Rocket Lab, again, pretend you have $3 million worth of hardware that's about to crash into the ocean and, and be destroyed. If you can catch it and recover it and refly it for under $3 million, it's a total win, right? It's, it's free money, basically. Um, so I think that's the ultimate thing. Even even if it costs two point eight million dollars there's still two hundred thousand dollars uh cheaper and an increased cadence too of, of production because you can you know you can ease your production rate if you uh if you're recovering boosters so for them they still have two three years of uh trying to fly as cheap and, and effectively and operationally and uh at a, at a high cadence as cheap as possible so yeah um I kind of think that's that's why they're still trying to catch it because they're years out. They they could probably potentially save millions of dollars. So we will see. Uh, looks looks like the reusable stage is stainless steel. Uh, I take it's for entry purposes. No, it is still uh, it is still carbon composite. They just have a thin um, thermal f like foil on it, almost some kind of reflective thermal thermal foil. But it is still carbon composite. It just has this like protective coating on it. So the whole rocket is still carbon composite. There is no liner, there is no new tankage or anything like that. It is still all carbon. So, yeah. Um, I'm not quite sure what, Taylor, what you mean by the benefit over semi-cryo over fully cryo. So um, I think, um, unless you're talking about like deep cryo versus cryo, um, deep cryo, so let, let's, uh, let's make sure we are clear on, on cryo. Cryogenic propellants would be those uh, that need to be chilled uh, well below freezing of, of, of water, right? So, um, you know, liquid oxygen is a, like minus 183 degrees Celsius or something like that. Um, liquid liquid meth or liquid hydrogen is something like minus 240 Everyone, just or an update for those of you who have joined us again, uh, that we are in a hold at T minus 12 minutes while we wait for an update from our launch director on whether we'll proceed through to T0. But on your screen, you've got those live views coming in from the recovery helicopter out over the Pacific Ocean. Our hold should not have an effect on these recovery procedures, so uh, don't, no worries there. But we'll come back to you with an update as soon as we hear more from our launch director. Hopefully we still get an opportunity today because I am really excited for this. <laughs> oh, man. Okay, so... Um, so Again, just making sure we're defining cryo. So um, this particular rocket uses RP-1, so Carolox basically, uh, which would be RP-1 or kind of like a refined version of jet, a jet fuel, and it uses liquid oxygen. So um, as far as, I've never really heard the, the term semi-cryo, but I would guess I'd consider Carolox to be semi-cryo because one of your propellants, your fuel, is non-cryogenic and your oxidizer is cryo. There's not necessarily a benefit, but uh, liquid oxygen is just the most dense. It's not necessarily the most dense, but it is one of the most dense. It's kind of a good middle ground of density and performance. You can get higher uh, performance with different oxidizers, such as fluorine and other um, exotic oxidizers, but they're a pain in the butt and expensive to work with, things like that. So um, liquid oxygen is kind of considered the, the standard for non-hypergolic oxidizers. Um, but yeah, I mean, I guess and as far as non Cryo, cryo uh, fuels, you do have, again, hypergolic fuels like. All operators, this is the LD on mission. I've resumed the count. So we are now at 13 minutes, 26 seconds and counting. The new T0 time is a 224952 UTC or 104952 New Zealand Standard Time. 59 or 51? I missed that. 
someone remind me, is it 5.9 or 5.1? Um, let me know. I'm waiting quick, and I'll, then I'll keep... Oh, I guess I can just do the math. 13. So there we go. That was good news from our launch director. The count has resumed towards our launch today from LC1 of there and back again. We have a new T0 time. It's 10.49 a.m. I can confirm I am uh, actively monitoring mission cord, LV cord, range cord, and safety net. Just to uh, finish up there, I just want to confirm All that we have a new... Please be prepared for a go-no-go -go poll at T minus 12 minutes. Okay, so we have a new T0 time at 10.49 a.m. New Zealand local time, or 22.49 UTC. And as you heard from our launch director there, we are about 18 seconds away from the go-no-go no go poll for this mission. So we'll wait here with mission control comms and listen in to what our operators have to confirm. Sweet. So hopefully, yeah, they'll go through the, the go-no-go no go poll. Sometimes they do that on air, sometimes they don't. So we will this is the LD on mission with a uh, go no go sequence poll yes. stage. Stage is go. Avionics. Avionics is go. GNC. GNC is go. Vcon. Vcon is go. T1. T1 is go. GC. GC is go. PLS. PLS is go. RSO. RSO is go. Met. Met is go. MM. MM is go. LD sub. LD sub go. All operators, this is the LD on mission. Uh, go no go sequence is complete. We are T minus 11 minutes, that's 24 seconds and counting. We are go for terminal count at T minus 10 minutes. From this time, the three word hold procedure is in effect. All right, that is fantastic news. Hopefully, yeah, I think everything's good to go. I can't wait. This this is an exciting mission, guys. This is a big one. Okay, cool. I can, so... Oh. So there you have it. We are back on track because that is confirmation from Mission Control that the systems are healthy and we will be proceeding with the remainder of the count. The T0 liftoff time is a new time of 10.49 a.m. New Zealand local time, or 22.49 UTC. So liftoff time for our Eastern Time Zone viewers is 18.49, and for our Pacific viewers it is 15.49. Awesome. Today is Electron's time to shine, but recently we also celebrated a major step forward in our program for Neutron, our much bigger new rocket. We have broken ground at the location of our new Neutron production complex and launch pad in Wallops Island, Virginia. It's here we are planning to create more than 200 new jobs to support Neutron's development and its launch capability from the Mid-Atlantic Regional Spaceport. Neutron is our new launch vehicle designed to lift 13 tons of payload and to provide a tailored launch solution for satellite mega constellations. Neutron will take Rocket Lab reusability another step into the future as a fully reusable rocket designed to land back on the launch pad after a mission and from there be returned to the nearby production complex for refurbishment and reflight. With construction underway and Neutron's development really ramping up, there are many exciting opportunities to join the team. You can check these out for yourself on the careers page of our website at rocketlabusa.com. That's going to be so awesome. I do remember I do have a 50-some minute conversation with Peter Beck, their CEO, about Neutron. If you guys want to dive into all of the crazy things of that upcoming rocket, that I'm really excited for. I love that it's going to be launching from here in the United States, so I can... Hopefully go out there and, and uh, definitely capture the first launch of that thing. Uh, that will be awesome. I cannot wait. I love the avionics, design. Avionics, LD on mission. LD avionics. Uh, yes, sir. Please proceed with sequence 56, avionics terminal checks. Proceeding with sequence 56, avionics terminal checks. Sweet. Okay, so uh, we had a great question here. And this is um, what... Today oh. we're lifting off from Sorry. Pad A at Launch Complex 1, but right next door is Pad B, where we will be hosting a very exciting mission next month. Flying in May from Launch Complex 1, we are taking the step before the leap with the launch of the capstone mission to the moon to support NASA's intent to return humans to the lunar surface. 
With our Electron rocket and our Photon spacecraft, our role is to deliver the Capstone small satellite owned and operated by Advanced Space to a particular orbit of the Moon where NASA is planning for Gateway, a future small space station to provide astronauts with access to the Moon. Their capstone will test and verify the orbital stability of that location, as well as test whether communication with NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter can gauge positioning, potentially allowing future spacecraft to determine their location relative to the Moon without having to rely on tracking from Earth. Here's more about the mission and how we'll deliver it to the Moon with Electron and Photon. Now, this one I'm excited for, but unfortunately, because we always get copyright strikes on these things, uh, I would have to mute this, and I will keep answering your questions. So the question was, what's what will the speed be of the booster uh, when it's when they're uh, basically when it's falling on a parachute? And the speed is something like 35, 36 kilometers an hour, about 22 to 24 mile an hour. It's pretty slow, um, which obviously is a good thing. Nice, gentle, and easy, well within the range of a helicopter's, um, you know, descent and ascent speeds, easily, easily, easily. So. Um, this is from Matthew. Will the helicopter be recovery uh, possible from wallops as well? Definitely, 100%. This, this system, if it works out, there's no reason why they can't do this exact same thing from wallops in the United States as well. Um, this is uh, Arvid, good question. How does it work with a helicopter when there's a no-flight zone because of the rocket launch? So they, what likely they, they do, they probably will have some kind of exemptions in general for this vehicle, but they also will probably fly slightly outside of the main corridor and some kind of less risky area um, and, and be stationed there and then be able to fly in once they know, you know, at a certain point, you know the exact trajectory of the rocket. You know, even if it were to, you know, blow up or whatever, you know the debris field, all of that stuff. So I'm sure there's contingencies and backups and all these plans in place to keep the helicopter in a safe place um, until they have good confirmation that it's, you know, the chutes have been deployed and then they can uh, fly in and scoop it up, you know. So these are great graphics though. They look really familiar to the ones we did for for the Artemis uh, versus Apollo mission. Okay, um, this is from JK saying, do I believe the Electron will ever become 100% reusable like Neutron is supposed to be? First off, no, because uh, Neutron is not supposed to be fully reusable either. I think she accidentally said fully reusable, but that upper stage uh, from last we heard or know is, is not going to be fully reusable. So Electron definitely has way less margins and no way. Actually exciting mission supported by the hundreds of team members in the Rocket Lab family at locations across the world. Right now the team are preparing the Electron rocket for that mission, running through the final tests and checks of Photon, confirming the phasing orbit mission trajectories, readying the launch pad and spacecraft integration facilities, and preparing systems for the mission. We're proud to be working alongside NASA, Advanced Space, and Terran Orbital to deliver this historic mission and play our part in humanity's return to the moon. But turning our attention back to the pad at LC1 now, and we can see that Electron's top clamp has opened and the strong back has moved away from the launch vehicle. This is a good visual indication that the mission is on track for liftoff, retracting the strong back out of the way for Electron to power off the pad at T0 and a look at the countdown clock and we can see that we are just minutes away now from the final operational procedures before launch very exciting we remain go for launch with greens across the board for the launch vehicle payloads the weather and our recovery team i saw a good question i just wanted to answer really fast and it was why is that capstone mission going to the nrho near rectilinear halo orbit the same one that artemis is going into it's because they're basically doing exactly that they're kind of testing out that orbit uh, for NASA to give them some data. It's a really cool mission. I can't wait to, to talk about but about it more. Flight computers on the rocket take over the launch countdown from manual control. At T minus one minute 30 seconds, we should hear the call that locks loading is complete on Electron, telling us that the vehicle is fully fueled for launch. At T minus one minute, the call will come from mission control that Electron's first and second stages are pressurized for launch and the vehicle is ready. Then we'll move to the final countdown to liftoff at T minus 10 seconds and engine ignition shortly before liftoff at T zero. Let's go to mission control comms now and listen into our launch director take us through the final count. So again, I, you know, I'll, I'll let them talk go obviously. GC mission. Uh, go GC. ECS disabled, pad auto sequences armed, pad is ready for launch. Copy. 
So again, stick with me guys, we've got a lot of good questions to answer, so during the coast phase or after the mission, I'll, I'll sit around and I will spend a good amount of time with you guys going over all your questions that are in our queue. Uh, again, don't forget, you don't have to super chat or be a member or anything, just ask a good question and it'll the hopefully it'll end up good okay. for us. Look at all the team members Every watching. Every system is on and set power and enable for flight. Roger, thank you, sir. GNC, LD on mission. LD, GNC. Oh, yes, sir. Confirm all expected recovery as goes. Our green and being monitored. Confirmed. All operators, this is the LD on mission with the LD go for launch. From now on, there should be no red flags on your critical LCCs. Econ, LD on mission. LD, Econ. Confirm all expected flight computer as goes. Our green. Confirmed, green. Econ, lock auto sequencing confirmed. Confirmed, locked. All operators, we are go for auto sequence start at T minus two minutes. LD is go for launch. Sweet. Everything's good to go, guys. This is awesome. This is this is exciting stuff. This is this reminds me, yeah, someone in Discord, Taylor in Discord says this gives me vibes of OG two, the first recovery mission of the Falcon 9, too. I, I kind of have a similar vibe going right now, and it's it's making me really excited for this. Um yeah, and again, I see a lot of new members and stuff like that. Uh, thank you guys for that reminder. Hopefully, you'll get your first. Uh, I'll be able to release the first part of my latest interview with Elon Musk at Starbase uh, this week. Hopefully, I think wait for a final approvals and permissions. Um, and of course, as a as a quality control factor, again, YouTube members and Patreon members. have switched to internal power. We'll get first dibs on that as well. So if you are a YouTube member or a Patreon supporter, get ready. Uh, there's going to be some really exciting content coming. Enabled for flight. Locks load complete, lock system in recirculation. My heart's beating pretty fast right now, honestly. I haven't been this nervous for a launch in a long time. It'll be amazing if they can bring us live footage. But again, understandable oh, if they can't. Disabled. Stage one and stage two are pressed for flight. High flow engine purge is enabled. Alrighty, Deluge everybody. is activated. That's the water deluge they activated. You may see it at the base of the rocket. Had to get engine ignition. I'm gonna, it's 20 seconds and counting. I'm gonna be quiet from now on. Pointy end is up, flaming end is down. Good luck, Rocket Lab. We are all cheering for you. Let's go, guys. Yes. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And we have lift off. Yes. is nominal. T plus 31 seconds into the mission and Electron is airborne after our 26th launch from LC1. We have a great view of that Electron leaving the pad as Electron powers its way to space. We are now at three or four kilometers in altitude and very soon Electron will reach max Q. This is what's known as the point in the mission when the aerodynamic forces against the rocket are at their peak and cause the most amount of stress Electron will experience on its ascent. The call that we've cleared max Q should come from mission control shortly. <laughs> I feel for that tracking camera person. I've been there, done that. <laughs> it's, it's hard. Especially, uh, Electron's so small. Beacon has cleared max Q. There we go. Cleared maximum aerodynamic pressure, that's always good. 
having cleared Max Q, Electron's trajectory remains on track and its propulsion is looking nominal as the mission continues to orbit. Soon we'll be coming up to the separation of the rocket stages that will signal the beginning of our Electron recovery attempt. First up will be MECO or main engine cutoff on Electron's first stage. This is when the rocket nine. This is when the rocket's nine Rutherford engines on its first stage power down, and then the rocket will drift for just a moment before the first and second stage separate. The second stage's engine should then start up and power the mission onto orbit, while Electron's booster begins its journey back toward the capture zone here on Earth. As it makes its way home, we'll stay with that live camera feed for as long as we can. But before we get ahead of ourselves, let's wait for the call out of those first three events. Let's do this. I love you can see the little cold gas thruster there, right on the edge of the stage. To Miko. Miko confirmed. Stage separation successful. Yes. Oh, that's awesome. Stage two ignition confirmed. Yes. And here we go. It is happening. Electron has successfully completed Miko stage separation and second stage engine start. Our Electron recovery attempt is now officially in motion, and we are off to a fantastic start with this mission. As the mission continues for our customers, the fairing protecting their satellites will soon separate and fall away in preparation of payload deployment. We'll wait to see that on our screens. Okay. Oh, and there it goes. <laughs> we had that visual and audio confirmation we were after of the fairing successfully deploying. A check of stage two speed and altitude tells us the mission is continuing nominally, currently at more than 125 kilometers above Earth and reaching speeds of more than 8,000 kilometers per hour. Onward to orbit. Stage two propulsion is nominal. Yes. Guidance is nominal. So this is. I, I just hope if we can catch this with a helicopter and, and see the footage of it catching, that is going to be the coolest thing ever. When the booster's engines shut down, the stage continued to coast to apogee. Now, during that coast, the reaction control thrusters on the stage will have moved Electron into position to better help it survive its hot and fast travel on the way back to Earth. Once we hear the call that the first stage has reached Apogee, we know that what goes up must then come back down and head toward the capture zone where our recovery helicopter is waiting for it. And again, yes, they are attempting to live stream from the helicopter, the actual catch. So I really hope that the stream works. They were showing it working earlier, but we all know how live streams can <laughs> fail unexpectedly. I give them all the grace in the world if, if they're unable to. So um, it will be very exciting. Oh man, I can't wait. So at, at this point around here, likely the booster is starting to fall back because it was actually going up at stage separation. So it's gonna go up and coast up to its apogee and then fall back down. Um, on particular with like SpaceX's Falcon 9 missions, they show stage one telemetry as well. So you can watch that. So after stage separation, notice that it'll still be going up. Electron seconds. Electron second stage engine, as you heard there, is continuing nominally and firing hot as the mission continues to orbit. All payloads on the stage remain healthy and ready for release to their 520 kilometer circular orbit. The next milestones to watch out for will be the deployment of the first chute on the Electron booster and the swap of the batteries powering the stage two Rutherford engine. Now, both events should occur within seconds of each other and be confirmed across mission control comms, so we'll make sure to listen out for those. Meanwhile, our recovery helicopter is ready and waiting out over the Pacific Ocean for that drogue chute on the Stage 1 to deploy, knowing that will indicate the main chute deployment and helicopter catch attempt will be only minutes away. Live footage from the booster. Definitely looks like it'll have gone through, gone above Apogee now and just falling back down. Taking a look at the telemetry, Electron's second stage continues on its journey to orbit at a speed of over 11,000 kilometers an hour and an altitude of more than 220 kilometers. 
Meanwhile, Electron's first stage is on the correct angle of attack to make its way through the wall, as you can see on your left there. Now, that wall is the roughest part of the atmosphere, but thanks to the RCS booth, uh, thrusters we mentioned earlier, the Stage 1 booster is on a very smooth descent. We are coming up to the next gate, though, for Electron's second stage to clear, the battery hot swap for its Rutherford engine. This engine is the world's first to use the electric pump feed cycle for orbital space travel. To keep the propellant pump system going all the way to orbit, we swap out the batteries as they are drained with a new set to keep the system running. We're likely to catch the glint of sunlight reflecting off the discarded battery packs as they fall away, so keep your eyes on your screen for that and your ears open for the call from Mission Control to confirm. Okay, so yeah, watch, you'll see that silvery pack in the top right corner there get jettisoned. There's going to be two of them that jettison at the same time. Those are large lithium ion battery packs that get jettisoned, and then they end up burning up in the atmosphere. Let's see it. That's always a big milestone. There we go. There we go. That looked good. It's still Hot running. Hot swap successful. Battery jettison confirmed. Can we have one drive deploy? Stage two propulsion holding nominal. Yes, that's always important. Guidance is nominal. Drive deployed. Battery hot swap is confirmed, and so too, you heard it there, the deployment of the drogue chute on Electron's first stage. The second stage is continuing nominally on its mission for our customers. You can see it on your screen there. And for recovery, we are around 30 seconds or so away from the main parachute being released. This action should really slow down the booster's travel to a slow enough speed for our recovery helicopter to safely move in and attempt to capture it. Oh, man. Oh, I can't wait. Hopefully, that'll be the next thing we hear is hopefully whether or not the shoots have deployed. Confirmed good shoot. Let's go, let's do this. Yes. Now I just hope we get helicopter footage. Fantastic news there from Mission Control. We have just had confirmation that the main parachute on stage one was successfully deployed and the S-92 helicopter can prepare to capture Electron. Yes. We'll be bringing you updates as soon as we have them, but very soon we are also expecting Seco on the final stage separation of the kick stage. We'll wait for those calls, but stick with this view from the helicopter as long as we can. So see that orange hook? That's that's the hook down there at the bottom. And all they have to do is snag the two lines together. They don't have to like get the hook on the line. They just have to get the two lines to cross because there's going to be a, a drogue line behind the main chute and then just this line hanging from the helicopter. So all it has to do is run into that line anywhere once, you know, and then keep flying. And it, it will kind of snag it and grab onto that hook, which collapses Entered the parachute. Detect. Guidance is in terminal. 27 seconds remaining. It's a bit longer of a second stage burn than normal to get us to our 520 kilometre SSO orbit. Uh, on the left, you can see the helicopter moving into position, and on the right, we have Electron's second stage travelling on to orbit. Looks like the helicopter's booking it right now. So that's what I was thinking. They're probably going to keep it in a fairly safe place and have to just scoot Seco. over. Oh, yes, they had Seco. Stage three, separation confirmed. Normal transfer orbit achieved. Good. You see on the screen there, the Rutherford engine on Electron stage two has successfully shut down and stage two and the kick stage will have cleanly separated. The kick stage will now enter what we call a coasting phase while it's in an elliptical orbit before its Curie engine ignites and propels it into its sun synchronous orbit where we will deploy the satellites. Now, on the left of your screen, you can see the views from that recovery helicopter. We have only a few minutes left in the capture window where that helicopter can safely recover Electron. Remember, catching a returning rocket stage mid-air as, as it returns from space is as 
highly complex as it sounds and it demands extreme precision. So several critical milestones must align perfectly to ensure a successful capture. We are on track to do that, but we are prepared with an ocean vessel nearby. And we've just had confirmation as well that the parachute is in sight of the pilot on that chopper. Exciting stuff. Hopefully we'll see it on our screens there soon too. We probably won't see it until almost the last second because this camera appears to be pointing almost straight down above a cloud deck too. So I'm sure they're not going to try catching it inside the cloud deck. We are all waiting on the edge of our seats here at our facilities. If this catch is a success, it marks an enormous milestone in our recovery program. Let's hope we can see that parachute in the frame of the camera soon. This is going to be huge if they can do this. Can you imagine with that helicopter We've got pilot? various members of our uh, recovery team stationed at the drop zone back on land, out on the recovery vessel for support. Here in MCC, they're in that crowd, as you've seen in some of our shots. And of course, we have our pilot in the powerful Sikorsky S-92 helicopter in the sky over the Pacific, ensuring this is all going according to plan. Now, you can see some of our recovery team members there. Uh, I don't think they could get any closer to that screen if they could. <laughs> they are no doubt very anxious and waiting like we all are for this capture attempt to go ahead. Looks like the pilot has slowed down, which is why the, the slack of the line has, has caught up. So hopefully they're really close here. And someone said they should have used a fisheye lens. I think they're on a pretty wide angle lens there. It's just that it's uh, they're moving so quickly that the, the line gets out of the, the angle of view pretty quickly. And they don't want to go too wide because then, you know, when you're at the end of a hundred meter long uh, line there, the, the rocket will look teeny, 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 tiny. And it's already pretty teeny, teeny, tiny. So, oh man, we haven't seen anything yet, right? It was only three years ago, can you believe it, that we announced the recovery and reusability program. And here we are today after five successful previous re-entries bringing us to this moment. What you can see on your screen is the line from the helicopter with the capture hook at the end of it. Uh, that pilot is moving into position to attempt that catch with the electron booster underneath the parachute. Hopefully we'll see that on our screen soon. Uh, but keep your fingers crossed for this attempt. Now he's booking it again, you can tell. Yeah, you can tell how... Uh... Just very quickly while I can, I want to point you to the right side of the screen that shows that the kick stage is on its elliptical pass above the world and onward to orbit for our customers. And then of course again, we're all keeping our eyes on the left that you can see the recovery helicopter in that zone uh, moving in for the catch attempt. Hopefully again that we see that soon. Of course, this is their the first time they've done anything like this. So, um, yeah, we don't know how long this could take. I think they have a good ten minutes of airtime, if I remember right. Ken looks like he's the pilot's going relatively slow now. We are looking down, for those curious, we're looking down from the bottom of the helicopter, down the, the catch hook line. I don't know about all of you viewing, but the longer I watch this line waiting for that heli the uh, parachute to come in. Oh. There it is. There it is. Oh, there we go. We've got our first glimpse of it. Yes. Holy crap. He got it. They got it. I guarantee you they got it.
absolutely incredible stuff there. We have successfully caught that electron booster underneath the parachute. So that helicopter, confirming again, has hooked onto the drogue line and has captured electron. Just incredible. So now the helicopter will bring the stage to land where our engineers will analyze and determine if electron is suitable for reflight. Not sure what the giant awe from everyone was. Hopefully, hopefully they're just sad that it's in the clouds now, and hopefully didn't like lose it at this point. Oh man! Hopefully, nothing bad happened. <laughs> Now we're going to take a bit of a break on the webcast, but we will be back with you closer to payload deployment for the primary mission to listen into those final moments from mission control. I'll see you back here soon. Well, hopefully everything's okay. I didn't love, uh, I didn't love that giant awe sound from everybody. Uh, I'm going to turn down what is actually my own music. That's hilarious. I don't know if I've ever streamed when they're playing my music, believe it or not. I think I've missed, like... No, 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 I have. I have. That's fun. Um, I hope the line didn't break. We'll have to wait to hear from them, of course. Uh, we can speculate all day on what happened. Um, for, for those of you saying, did they catch it on their first try... I would actually hesitate to call it their first try because they have caught and practiced catching, uh, you know, a booster over and over and over again. You know, mock-up boosters, payload simulators. So this pilot is, is well practiced at this point. So I wouldn't, you know, it's not like this is like something they have never, you know, I mean, obviously the, the full portion of it is, is new, right? But they've done all portions of this from re-entry to splashing down, you know, all of the different parts. Um, so the fact that they can definitely get this far has proved uh, has proven quite a bit. I really Let's see. I'm checking Twitter. Twenty seconds ago, helicopter catch. So I think we're still good. I think we're still good, guys. We'll have to wait and see what they what they say. Um, wait, why do, why do people think... It, I don't know, we'll have to see. Yeah, so, I mean, pretty recently, just within a minute, they, they said helicopter catch. So hopefully, hopefully all is good. Oh man, I'm like glued to Twitter right now. <laughs> man. <laughs> Michael Pound in our Discord says maybe the giant awe was they all just saw something really cute. <laughs> That's amazing. All right, well let me take a little bit of time here then to to go through a few more of your your questions and stuff and Again, while we got all of you guys here, I wanted just, of course, to say thank you for watching along with me. This is obviously uh, really exciting for me to be able to cover this. Um, but, but of course, I need to thank my Patreon supporters and YouTube members. Again, you guys will be getting some sneak peeks. You'll get first access to those upcoming Elon interviews to double check spellings and errors and audio glitches, things like that, because there is a lot of content that's going to be coming out in the next couple weeks. And, uh, and it's always good for me to have as many eyes and ears as possible watching that before it goes live because I don't, it's really bad to take content down off YouTube and have to re-upload it. So that's what we try to avoid. Uh, that's the way I've always done things. People are like, you paywall. It's like, this is literally since day one of Everyday Astronaut. The reason that I think the quality is so high is we've done reviews from our Patreon supporters almost day one, like very early on within the first year. We started sharing all of the, the previews and stuff uh, with Patreon supporters to help make sure that the content is great no problems no errors that way it's it's high quality uh and hopefully as evergreen as possible that's the whole thing i don't want errors that are going to date themselves and, and yeah all of that stuff so um yeah so thank you again to all of you watching uh don't forget to check out our web store too everydayastronaut.com shop check out some of our merchandise today i forgot to put in a coupon code for all of you lovely people but if you do want to support what i do head on over to our web store as well everydayastronaut.com shop 
But in the meantime, let's answer a lot more of you guys' questions because I'm sure there's going to be quite a few more pouring in. Um, yeah, so... Uh, oh, yeah, so right off the bat, the first thing people are asking is how are they going to get it back from uh, from the ocean? For this, these first early attempts, they're going to basically be taking the rocket and putting it onto a ship that's nearby. There is a recovery vessel out there. They did that for two reasons for this one. is One, to be able to make it so they can just land, you know, put the, the rocket back in the cradle there. Um, so it's easy, so it's, it's, it's the, you know, the most margins for error for the helicopter for the first try. But also in case the helicopter missed or something happened and it splashed down, they did want to still recover the, the rocket anyway in general. So um, it's also out there for that as well. So let's, um, this is a great question. David Smith, uh, when returning from space, does the rocket have the ability to guide itself? For example, does it have any nitrogen thrusters on the rocket? The answer is yes. They have um, just a, a set of, of cold gas thrusters on each side of the booster. Um, some thrusters, you know, each, each puck has like three, maybe four. Maybe five, actually, but I think it's actually only three. I don't think they worry about translating, um, you know, up and down the axis. They only have thrusters that basically say this is the, the rocket. Each pack has a thruster that fires this way, this way, and this way. That allows them to be able to control all axes, including roll. Um, but they, like I said, I don't think they have any pointing, you know, downwards or upwards because they're not worried about precisely landing the booster like SpaceX does. So SpaceX actually has um, thrusters that, that can point and shoot downward. Um, as well, and that that helps them, you know, really hone in their trajectory, um, their 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 parabola, their 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 falling trajectory. So, yeah, um, this is from Justin for accidentally misspelling Maria's name. Uh, thank you very much. This is very true. Um, this is literally true in this case. Thank you very much, me. Uh, Super chats do quite literally cover the bills here uh, at Mars and the other studio and all the things we're doing, including the website crew. All of these things, you know, obviously this is no longer just me sitting in my bedroom making videos, but we tr we have a, a pretty large team of people now. So uh, all of you guys' generous support goes directly into to making all of it happen. So I know that everyone always wants, you know, more and more videos, as do I, but I care these days, having a, a platform this large, I care more and more and more about having accurate, high quality information. You know, this is something that I've always prided, prided uh, Everyday Astronaut on is, is kind of getting deeper into these topics, uh, taking those bigger risks on videos that, like when I made the Raptor video, people thought I was crazy for making a 53 minute long video. And now I know for a fact that people are using that video in curriculum in college cl classrooms, and they're even some recruiters are using it for SpaceX employees and things like that. So I, I think that's more important to me in the grand scheme than just cranking out a bunch of videos all the time. It's the quality of the videos that matters to me. So again, huge thank you to Patreon supporters and any financial support via you know, super chats and all that stuff. It all makes a world of difference. Um, this is uh, from Nin with with a bin. Could you see this catch method of the booster for some of the other small launch providers like Firefly? Yeah, I mean, I guess we'll find out if it if it seems to be worth it. Um, Firefly is quite a bit bigger booster. It's a good four times larger. Um, at some point, you definitely run into the limitations of an off the shelf helicopter. Um, and, but we'll see if this is a valid method. We might see this pop up all the time, you know. So, so of course, don't forget. I, I, like I said, I have a video kind of about this recovery method. Just type in uh, "everyday astronaut rocket lab helicopter," and I'm sure you'll find it. But it, it kind of goes into like all of the other times in history that we've caught stuff like this with helicopters or airplanes from space, including you know why we're uh, SpaceX for a little while was catching their um, fairing halves in with the boats. They no longer do that, and why they didn't use helicopters. Uh, we talk about how Vol the upcoming Vulcan rocket hopefully will have some um, aerial capture as well of just the engine section for their smart reuse as well. So, um, yeah, lots of uh, lots of lots of potential here. I guess we'll see how well it goes. Um, yeah. Um, this is uh, from Binet. Uh, how much longer do we have to wait? So I'm waiting for approval. I have to get legal approval just to make sure there aren't any ITAR violations in the content shot. Um, we're also still actually editing all the content, including making sure the audio is perfect. Because again, remember guys, people are like, just post it, just post it. Well, first off, I don't want a $250,000 ITAR violation and 10 years in prison. No offense, but I, I think I'll wait to make sure I'm clear of those things. Uh, but the other thing that's important to me is making sure there aren't just nasty audio glitches that aren't, you know, really bad, uh, you know, the cuts and everything are nice and clean. We were lucky, lucky enough to have two cameras this time. One of the cameras shot 1.2 terabytes of footage. 
thank you, Black Magic, <laughs> for having 12K raw a thing. It's a quite hefty file size. So just even working with those files is taking a little bit longer, um, adding to a little bit of the workflow. But again, the, what matters most to me is that at the end of the day, I want to be able to look back at this content in 5, 10, 20 years and know it's the highest quality that I could have possibly made. So, so we're, we're waiting on two things. We're waiting on finalizing edits, and we're also waiting on approval of those edits. So there's kind of a couple things. So obviously your patience is appreciated, but um, yeah. Um, let's see here. So I guess we'll see. Um, we're still we're starting to hear rumors about the rocket, but yeah. We'll see. We will see. Uh, the, Jay French, unfortunately, I, you know, they don't publish any of the things about you know the recovery conditions and things like that. So we, we really have no idea. But I'm again guessing for these first attempts, a lot of things are just going to be more conservative. So in general, they're not going to be pushing the envelope on weather conditions on on anything. Everything's going to be as big of margins of safety as they can, including, you know. Um, that weather constraints, fuel constraints of the helicopter, all of these things. So, yeah. Um, one of the models will be up for sale. Um, again, we have some incredible Falcon 9 models. You should look, for, I, I've got a couple of teasers up on, on Twitter a couple of times. We've talked about it on, on uh, supporter streams and stuff like that too. But we, we make, we're starting a 1 100th scale model rocket collection. And these are really high quality, like metal rockets that are, that are you know, just really strong and beefy. I'm so excited for them. Uh, very high detail. Uh, the packaging is amazing with, you know, uh, the, the first set that we're doing is gonna be our founder's edition. So the first uh, set that we're gonna be selling, we're gonna try selling a thousand of these things. And I'm signing every one of them with a little certificate. Um, so I'm really, really excited for those. Those are hopefully gonna be out by the end of this month. Uh, we're, we're planning to be shooting them by the end of May. So, or in the middle of May, so. We will see, we will see. Thank you for becoming a member, Peyton. That really means a lot. Um, let's see here. This is for four months of membership from Curious Gamer. Enjoy the launch, everybody. I sure did. That was incredible. Um, oh, cool. This is from ProStorm saying, congrats, Jimmy, on your new job at Rocket Lab. That's awesome. Congratulations, Jimmy. Uh, quite proud. Um, so Rocket Lab just a second ago did post there and back again. Just still images from the recovery. I could switch over to that if you guys want. Um, let's see here. Let's just check this out here. Let me go. Let me navigate to this quick here. Oh, it's right there. Derp. And then bring this up for you guys. So this was 45 seconds ago. We still don't have confirmation that they still have it, but... They are touting there and back again, which it is true, even if they didn't catch it, it, it was there and back again. We'll see, guys. Man, I am excited and nervous and excited and, man, we will keep that up there for all of us. But, man, who else is like, kind of got their heart, you know, beating out of their chest. <laughs> I mean, honestly, <sighs> this was a big one. This feels to me like some of the early SpaceX, you know, so, uh, launch and, and landing attempts. I watched every landing attempt starting from CRS-3 on until they finally landed their first one in 2015. So I, I've kind of gone through this. So this, this does feel quite familiar to me. All right, I'll, I'll get them back up here for you guys so you can make sure we're not missing anything. Um, sorry that, yeah, my countdown, yeah, you can see it in there good enough if you need to. So that is interesting. Um, in interesting. Um, this is from Irene Klotz says, this is from the, the, apparently from the helicopter retrieval. Once I saw the shoot, I knew we had it. The pilot has never missed one yet, says Peter Beck. Booster may be dropped in the water and then retrieved by ship depending on sea state. Peter uh, Beck says, payload deploy in an hour. Interesting. Hmm. Still a little bit of a wait and see moment here for all of us. 
Hmm. We will see. Well, thank you very much from Sam Black. I really appreciate that. We really genuinely try our hardest to make just the best content we can for you guys. Um, this is from Eric C. Why does Rocket Lab use lithium ion batteries instead of supercapacitors to power the turbo pumps? Go Rocket Lab. That's a great question. Um, personally, I don't really know enough. There's a lot of new technology, you know, like, um, uh, I, so I can't even think of any right now. <laughs> like, um, what you know, like dry batteries and all these different, you know, water batteries, all these different things. Uh, and supercapacitors seems like they're getting to the point where they could be used and they're extremely power dense. Um, which would be great high energy output for a short period of time. It, it does seem ideal, but that's the cool thing about Electron is they can kind of let the rest of the industry, the rest of the you know energy industry catch up and produce these incredible um, you know bits of technology. So either better lithium ion batteries or other you know dry cell batteries, all these other you know solid state batteries, things like that. And then once someone has a viable technology, they can just buy it off the shelf basically and not have to develop it themselves. So it is a very competitive field, as we all know. There's literally, in this room, I'm looking at uh, dozens and dozens of lithium ion batteries. So obviously, whoever's doing the best at that uh, has built-in customers for people like, from people like uh, Rocket Lab as well. So good question. I'm sure they can evolve it as they need, but yeah. Um, why was the studio mothballed for a year? Because this studio is... Uh, five miles, eight kilometers away from Starbase. And Starbase, there has been no launches from Starbase. So personally, I still like to live in Iowa, uh, live, work, and, and just have my life in Iowa as much as possible. Um, but the idea behind Mars Studio B here was to be able to capture and record Starbase launches. Um, so Starship prototypes. And obviously after SN15, we no longer were seeing any Starship prototypes launch. So um, we're waiting. Well, obviously, we're still waiting for the FAA approval, see if that's going to happen or not, but we'll see. So that's why the studio studio hasn't been mothballed, per se. Uh, we actually, we've come out here several times to do major updates to the studio, which, of course, now are a bit in limbo. Like, are we even going to be using as much of this um, here if things were to move? So we have some cool plans in store. Like I said, you'll hopefully be seeing some of those plans here in the next, uh, this week. So... Yep, um, cool. Thank you from Gab LP for becoming a member. Um, this is from Nathan, very, very generous. Thank you so much, Nathan. I'm um, watching your videos for a while and you've inspired me to become an engineer and I hope to become an astronaut someday. That is awesome. Nathan, that is what this is all about right here. I, I, that means the world to me. I can't tell you when I meet people in real life and they, if they have a similar story like that. I've had um, a handful of people tell me almost exactly that, that, that they started watching my videos and got excited about aerospace and went into aerospace. So that means the world to me. Thank you so much for letting me know, Nathan. Um, thank you again, Sam Black. I think this is a repeat, but thank you so much. Um, again, from Sam Black. Uh, this, yeah, from Barry, this is, uh, it is a, a Hobbit reference, of course, New Zealand, Hobbit, whole thing, yep. Um, from Gab, thank you again. Maybe I'm getting repeat stuff by accident in here, but thank you again. Um, this is from um, Cobb Russell, um, uh, Aerospace. Hey Tim, I'm about 180 kilometers away from the pad. Hopefully I can see it, but uh, see it. But I love uh, watching your videos. Go Electron. I hope you could catch it. Um, I, you probably can't hear that thing from that far away. Um, I, you might not be able to catch a small Electron from 180 kilometers away, but I bet at night you might be able to. But daytime launches are quite hard. So, um, oh no! Oh wait. Oh, good. Okay. Not, oh no, I just am seeing other tweets. Um, yeah. Again, thank you, Sam Black, for becoming a member. Um, this is from a, this is awesome, from a fellow South Texan. Hello, Marcus Smith. Thank you very much for saying hi. Um, hey, we did, don't worry, launch recap, we did do our pointy end up, flaming end down. Um, you're welcome, Ed. Thank you so much. Uh, we're going to be using some of this as, uh, I've got Andrew in town here. We're working on a project here. So I'm going to take him out for dinner tonight. We'll get something delicious. So thank you so much, Ed Harrington. Uh, or ha Har sorry, Ed Harrigan. Yeah, you heard right, Andrew. <laughs> Andrew's like, food? Did I hear food? Yes, thank you very much. Um, what is the weight of an empty booster? Approximately one metric ton, so around 2,200 pounds or so. Um, yeah. Let's keep going here. Um, this is from Marcin Bader saying, 
Uh, hi Tim, glad to see more companies getting their toes wet in the rocket reusability. Do you know if they recover the battery after it's jettisoned? I don't believe they do. When they had jettisoned those batteries, they're pretty close to orbital velocity. There's something like over two thirds orbital velocity, maybe more like 75% orbital velocity, which is just so fast that those batteries are definitely going to burn up on reentry. <clears throat> on reentry, and it's, you know, in the grand scheme of things, those are probably really cheap. Um, you know, it might only be a few thousands of dollars, and, and payload mass on the second stage is just so vital to keep payload down on the second stage, because any mass you're taking with you on the second stage, um, except for those that, that get jettisoned, um, it really, really take a big penalty hit for, for payload capacity, so, yeah. Um, this is from North Ridgeway. Thanks for the recent masterclass on rocket engine types. You are welcome. I loved making that video. Huge, huge shout out to Casper to Stanley and for Andrew Taylor for helping with that video. The animations were just absolute next level. Again, those are the things that matter to me a lot because I learn a lot by watching something like that and, and following along. And I really like that we we're able to weave it up from you know the most simple rocket engine to the kind of the most complicated. Uh, I hope that you guys have all watched that. If you haven't watched that video yet, you should definitely do so, especially watch that video before you watch the Elon interviews that are about to drop here soon, because we get into some really, really, really deep stuff about Raptor 2, and even about Merlin, actually. We sat there and we talked uh, about Merlin for a long time, so that's um, a really, really fun conversation. So again, watching the engine cycle type video and the engine melting video, those two things are going to really, really help you out in this conversation. So, yeah. Um, Let's see, this um, from Simcha. I have, has anyone heard anything from Dear Moon? You know, I, they have gone radio silent. I hope everything's okay. Um, I personally have not heard anything yet either. So uh, I don't even know if, I don't know anything. So hopefully we hear something about that. Hopefully it's still on. Maybe they're just waiting for Starship to get further along or something before they make any announcements. I honestly have no idea, but thank you for asking. Um, a literal oh, I still love that name. What is the payload capacity difference between reusable and expendable electron? Nearly identical, believe it or not, because they aren't doing propulsive landing. So of course there's some extra payload mass considerations in the booster, but the booster doesn't take nearly as big of a payload penalty as the upper stage. So say you, let's say they add 100 kilograms of um, of mass for the, the parachutes, the drogue parachute, the COPVs, the, the thrusters, the extra support structures and all of those things. Um, at that point, uh, for the for the booster, it takes approximately a four to one payload penalty, as opposed to the upper stage, which takes a one to one. So that means, like, if say you add a hundred kilograms to your booster, you're only taking away approximately twenty five kilograms of payload capacity. So um, there's a chance that that all that extra mass does take a little bit of extra hit. Um, but the good thing is they they don't also have a, a um, you know they don't have a, a boost back burn or any of that stuff. They they actually run the tanks completely to depletion. So yeah. Um, so this was from, where is Irene getting all these? She must be with them right now or something because Irene, okay, um, let me read this to you from Irene Klotz, who, who I trust, she's a phenomenal space journal journalist. So she's not just saying this type of stuff willy nilly, but she says on Twitter, these are in quotes from Peter Beck. Wow, I can't believe we caught it. Beck says, We've now got to now we've got to operationalize that. It seemed to work. It all just happened. Um, only about half of electron launches will be able to be a, accommodate heli retrieval, um, night launches, etc. Beck adds. So she's very legit. Um, yes. So apparently she is on site. Awesome. Okay. Thank you so much, Irene, for that update. So we still haven't heard anything from Electron or Irene. Almost saying that they, you know insinuating that they haven't been able to, uh, that anything went bad, so. Yay, okay, let's keep going here. Thank you so much from uh, from Saturn Man. Uh, what type of headphones are these? I believe these are just the, the what are they, K2, the K2400s. Um, I believe they're Audio-Technica, right? Or AKG, um, the K240s, sorry, the K240s from AKG, kind of a, a staple for headphones for, for studio work. Uh, does, does the Electron do an, an, an entry burn? No, it does not. Um, Simon, why do we nearly always see a water contrail at max Q? It's just the right conditions where if you, um, there is water vapor, of course, in, in even RP-1, in anything there's going to be, in any of the rocket launches, 
uh, there will be water vapor. There's going to, have, of course, be oxygen uh, at some point attached to a, a hydrogen atom or even getting um, vaporized or something in, in certain regions of the atmosphere. Uh, it's just cold enough and thin enough in all the right conditions, and, and all it takes is either heating it up to turn it into ice crystals or just having extra bit of water vapor in your exhaust trail. So um, let's see here. Sorry. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll keep waiting here and see if we hear any more news. But um, from Jimmy Jennings, hey Tim, do you think companies will uh, are going to be forced to adopt a full flow engine design to stay competitive? Will this have a negative impact on space industry due to their complexity? I don't think you have to use full flow to be competitive at all. And I think Peter Beck, again, listen to, to my most recent interview with him back uh, last December about Neutron and why they're uh, not even, they're not even going for closed cycle for their Archimedes engine. He talks about the gas generator he goes, we're basically, they're just trying to make it really simple, reliable, and that's going to pay off more than squeezing every last drop of performance out of it. Um, full flow is amazing for a few reasons, but um, I don't know. We don't know if it's even the right choice for Starship, you know? Um, there's a small chance they'll get really far along into Starship development, and they'll go, man, this engine is just, it's too hard, it's not very reliable. And maybe they'll change, you know. So, so we don't know. Uh, you know, there's so many other design considerations beyond just the engine's flow cycle. So, um, we will see. We will see. Um, this is a good question from Sam saying, "How will Neutron be re uh, be returned to land? Helicopter as well? No, the Electron will always land at uh, return to launch site landing, unless there is happens to be an expended uh, Neutron, which uh, could be an option. But Neutron." will always land back at land um, propulsively. So it'll do a boost back burn, no entry burn, and then a landing burn. So, yeah. So people are asking that I go back and watch the footage. Um, yeah. So let's see here. This is um, from Head Game Maker. Random question: If a Falcon 9 first stage booster is going to be expended, will they put the landing legs and grid fins on it before launch? No. Th there's been several expended Falcon 9s, uh, especially early on in the reusability program. After they had reused it once for a little while, they're just kind of getting rid of them, and they would make sure to not throw away the landing legs and grid fins. So, yeah, great, um, great question. But we have a lot of data on that, and the answer is no. Um, any news on Starship? Uh, I, there's a, a decent amount of stuff that's talked about that hasn't been public yet in the conversation I had with Elon. Um, but as far as news about Starship, no, they're just working. I think the biggest thing everyone's waiting on right now is the FAA's uh, environmental assessment. So that at this point is, is hopefully coming back at the end of the month for the fifth month in a row, hopefully the end of the month. So we will see. We will see. Um, this is from Lucio or, or Lucio saying, what happens after the helicopter catches the booster? How do they safely land it without damaging its structure? That I, I don't know. I don't have those specifics. Um, I'm guessing they uh, have some kind of very large soft cradle for it to land in. And maybe it's something where, you know, an arm or something, you know, they kind of put it into this arm first and then help rotate and lay it down or something. I, I, I'm not sure. Um, People do want me to rewind the video. I just would hate if they came back in and actually gave us some kind of official update. Um, but we can rewind the video if you guys want um, and look for that. Okay, so we will look. Oh, I better make it so it's so you guys can see it better. Discord will let us know if they go live again. Absolutely incredible stuff there. We have successfully caught that electron booster underneath the parachute. So that helicopter confirming again has hooked onto the drogue line and has captured Electron. Just incredible. Let's see, so why did they say, oh, the there. Bring the stage to land where our engineers will analyze and determine if Electron is suitable for reflight. Hmm. 
profitable for I don't know why they say all there all of a sudden. Hunger, I watched. Okay. Oh, there we go. We've got our first glimpse of it. So we caught the line there. Is that what people think is a, is a snap? Absolutely incredible stuff there. We have successfully caught that electron booster underneath the parachute. So that helicopter, confirming again, has hooked onto the drogue line and has captured electron. Just incredible. So now the helicopter will bring the stage to land. But nothing happens there when they're going, aw. So I don't know. I don't know. I'm not going to really, it's not really too beneficial to to speculate too much more honestly guys until we get some official confirmation from rocket lab yeah maybe it's just because the video feed cut out that very well could be it but who knows we'll just wait um <laughs> who knows uh now this is just sitting here spinning and make sure we're live there we go we're up to date now turn what is actually my own music down? <laughs> I know we're not gonna get copyright striked on my own music, because I don't allow it to be copyright striked, so. Okay, um, this is a question from Arvid. How long can the helicopter wait for the launch? Like, how much fuel does it hold? They mentioned on stream that they do have uh, tanks to help extend the, the flight time of the vehicle, so. Um, I think, it, I'm sure it's several, several hours at this point, but I'm not sure how long it actually has uh, for actual full-on all-up flight time. Um, this is a good question. Keith, could uh, SpaceX use a big, very big uh, helicopter, like a MiG uh, M126 to move an empty Starship without Raptors from Boca Chica Starbase to the airport easier than to move by road? I don't know how big an uh, MI-26 is, but don't forget, an empty Starship is over 100 metric tons. Even in each Raptor's only one to two metric tons. I think it's only like like one metric ton. So three to six, you know, we're still talking about basically 100 metric tons. I don't think there's a helicopter out there that can lift Starship, so. Um, yeah. Uh, thank you so much from uh, Mandara. I really, wait, Mandanara. I really appreciate that. Uh, Jessica, thank you for becoming a member as well. Uh, this is from Trenton. What would happen if they were to miss the booster? It would fall and splash into the ocean like basically almost every other rocket booster in history. No big deal. Um, so let's see. Yeah, so someone says the, the MI-26 can lift about 60 tons. So, um, yeah, we're still a ways off there. <laughs> All right, we'll keep going here. Uh, so, what? yeah, if they miss the booster, it, it crashes into the ocean. There's a chance they don't recover it, and it's not going to be game-changing. Obviously, they'd like to... Keep doing this, keep practicing, and they would love to recover one to be able to see if they can refly one, but we will see. Um, Peter Dallas, I was wearing my, my normal hat, uh, hat for, for this launch. Uh, I'm always wearing my normal hat, but I'm also wearing it for this launch. <laughs> I appreciate it. Or lunch. I mean, you did say lunch twice, so maybe it is specifically for this you're eating lunch and watching. Uh, I appreciate that so much. From um, Broomy, how does the hook work without the lines separating? I'm not sure what you mean by separating. So basically, you have the main chute and you have a drogue chute. And because it's a directional circular parachute, you notice that has kind of vents in it to make it so it does kind of glide in one direction. The drogue chute ends up coming, you know, behind the parachute quite a bit. And there's a line there that's there. And that's actually what the helicopter pilot's trying to intersect. So there's just a, a, a horizontal uh, rope, basically. And then the, the, the helicopter has a vertical rope with a hook at the end of it. So all they're trying to do is they're trying to intersect those two lines. Those two ropes just need to come in contact, and the helicopter just needs to keep moving. The rope will kind of grow, will go until it gets hooked at the very end of it, and that'll end up hooking onto the drogue chute. And then once it's all under tension, it'll collapse the parachute. So there you go. Um, yeah, hopefully that answers the question. 
Uh, thank you so much, Steve. Um, I wouldn't quite consider this service. Uh, obviously, I'm not uh, in the in the military, but I do appreciate your tip, and I appreciate that you guys were all here watching along with me. This historic launch it was it was super fun to be able to cover a launch again. Uh, there's a lot of really fun launches coming this year. I mean, the ones that I'm looking forward to, of course, we have Fireflies Alpha hopefully coming up back out to the pad this year. That should be super fun. We have uh, we have SLS hopefully this year. We have um, I, SLS this year. Like I, SLS is happening this year. Starship hopefully this year. Obviously, a lot of stuff's up in the air right now, um, but we'll see. Then um, we also have Vulcan hopefully launching this year. So there's there's a lot of cool stuff. So I'm really excited. Um, I actually, Greg, unfortunately, I don't know if I can really uh, recommend, unfortunately, literally because of like FCC things or FTC, FTC, I don't know if I can have like a, a pumped stock symbol on right now, but I do appreciate your, uh, I just want to play it safe. I do appreciate your tip. Thank you so much. Um, this goose fam, does the FAA apply to New Zealand and obviously Rocket Lab? I don't exactly know the FAA's jurisdiction, how exactly it works uh, down in New Zealand. Um, yeah, that's something I, I would like to actually talk to Peter back about that because that's something I, I don't know. Um, yeah. Okay, um, this is a great observation from Adam Jones. That thing really screams off the pad. Yes, Electron is one of my favorite uh, ro ro rockets to watch launch off the pad because it has an awesome sound, and I just love that those Rutherfords just light up so quickly. It's just such a percussive and instant, you know, ignition sound. Just this, just like instant. That was a terrible impression, but you get the point. So, big fan of that. All right. Um, oh, 29 months of membership from Slithery. Thank you so much for being a member that long. I really appreciate that. From John, also becoming a new member. You guys are awesome. Uh, why do they jettison the batteries? This is a great question. So um, again, anything that's attached to the second stage, don't forget the second stage is taking things up into orbit. So any mass on the second stage um, that is not, say, the payload or fuel is mass that's taken away from the payload capacity. So say you have a, a second stage that dry weighs, we'll say, one metric ton versus a second stage that weighs dry two metric tons, just making up numbers here, um, and say you have a payload capacity of, of 10 metric tons normally, um, if, you, if you go from one metric ton to two metric tons, so twice as heavy on your second stage, that's going to come directly off of your payload panel, off your payload cap capability. So again, so it'd come down to like nine metric tons um, if your payload were, were twice as heavy in our example. So you basically can just directly take whatever mass the payload, uh, the second stage is, and take that off of the payload uh, capacity basically. So any change in that. So if you are able to dump batteries, which are, are dead weight, and the thing about batteries is unlike fuel. So um, let's see. Uh, I'm again not going to speculate until we hear anything more from Rocket Lab. Um, but yeah, so um, what was I saying? So batteries don't get lighter as they get drained. So unlike the, the turbine and a gas generator and all those things that use uh, propellant, you know, that does get lighter and lighter and lighter the more you use your propellant. So the propellant going through, say, a gas generator is expelled overboard. It is ditching that that weight. You know, they're using the energy from that the, those, those propellants and then ditching it overboard. Lithium-ion batteries, on the other hand, as they're drained, actually there is a very negligible weight difference or mass difference. Um, but for the most part, they, they're, they're identical weights, right? So um, an empty battery, once it's empty, is, is pointless. They actually stage the battery. So they have three batteries on electron, once they get uh, on the second stage of electron, uh, three battery packs. Once they get through, the, they deplete, they do a hot swap. So they actually de uh, eject uh, two sets of those batteries and have one remaining for the remainder of the burn. So um, let's see. Booster returns are super fun. Thank you, Scott, for uh, yep for cheering along with us. Ryan, um, if successful, will this only be the second recovered booster? The shuttle landed, but it was a different style of rocket, and the SOBs were solid, not liquid. So let's go through recovered boosters, recovered uh, flight hardware that had been recovered and reflown, um, at least like on. Uh, so of course we have the space shuttle, uh, which used. Uh, the orbiter, of course, was recovered, uh, as well as the SRBs, as you mentioned. Uh, the Ariane 5 actually recovered its boosters, but were, did not refly them for, I think, the first two flights, just to make sure everything was good on them. They, they intentionally recovered them. Um, okay, so this is, again, from Irene Klotz. I, I do trust this. 
Um, she says Peter and Lars, so Lars is on recovery team, I think, or I don't remember what Lars's exact position is. So the plan was for the helicopter to drop the booster onto the recovery ship. Oh. Okay, so just right now we will get an update here from, from Mariel, the, the host, and she will give us an update on what's going on. Um, but that will be awesome. So we'll wait for that. We'll just wait for that. Um, so, okay, so yeah, so Ariane 5, of course, New Shepard has successfully landed from, after going from space, it's not an orbital booster, an orbital rocket system, but that booster does land and it has been recovered propulsively. Um, rocket Lab has already recovered boosters, they've not reflown one, so even this one, until they refly it, you know, it just depends on, depends on how you want to, you know, slice this, this up. Um, but so far, Rocket Lab has successfully recovered electron boosters. So, um, I guess I don't know if this, this potentially is the second, um, Rocket Lab is, I guess, so we can say this, it's the second liquid-fueled orbital rocket booster to be recovered. How about that? Um, intact, I guess. There we go. So we will see. Um, well, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. <laughs> thank you. And this is from Darren from an everyday person. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, you guys are why I do this. Um, so, um, Ryan, so again, we'll wait for an update, but it does sound like it might have been intentional to drop it because of the, a bad sea state might have not allowed them to, to drop it gently onto the boat or the ship. We will see. Thank you so much um, from Paul. I'm going to just fly through these here as quick as I can because I think they're going to come back soon. I uh, wasn't even aware of this due to uh, handing in uh, in my master's thesis two hours ago, but great stream as always. Congratulations on handing in your master's thesis. It has to feel great. Uh, thank you for celebrating uh, your accomplishment here with us on the stream as well. So uh, big congratulations. I want to say a quick congratulations to Dominic because that's that's impressive. Um, from, from Ajna saying, kind of new here, what's uh, your history in aeronautics? So I actually, the reason I started this whole channel, oh, here we go. Welcome back to the webcast of Rocket Lab's 26th electron mission there and back again. If you're just joining us, today's launch included a successful liftoff at 10.49 a.m. New Zealand local time or 22.49 UTC. After passing through Max-Q, Electron completed a clean first and second stage separation. Now, of course, today's secondary mission objective was catching Electron's first stage booster with a helicopter. And if you are watching the mission you will have seen earlier, we witnessed a spectacular catch of Electron's first stage by our helicopter pilot. This is a monumental step forward in our program to make Electron a reusable launch vehicle. Now, after the catch, the helicopter pilot noticed different load characteristics than we've experienced in testing, which of course you do expect when testing anything in the field for the first time. At his discretion, the pilot offloaded the stage for a successful splashdown, where it is being recovered by our vessel for transport back to our factory. The stage is in great condition though, and we look forward to assessing it in detail when it's back here in the factory, and of course getting ready for more helicopter catches soon. Meanwhile, the kick stage has completed its first pass in an elliptical orbit of Earth, and we've had good ignition of its Curie engine to position the kick stage in sun-synchronous orbit, where we'll drop off the 34 satellites on board this rideshare mission for six customers. The deployments will happen in succession shortly after the Curie engine has shut down. So let's listen in. So not ideal, uh, I don't think, yeah, but... Yeah, Curie shut down. Nominal circularization. Sweet. But of course, uh, the, pilot's life, uh, the pilot's lives are very important, <laughs> the pr top priority. So if things weren't feeling right on their end, Brilliant. Of that is a good Curie shutdown confirmed there by Mission Control. So it is time to put some satellites on orbit. First up in today's deployment sequence are the spacecraft for eSpace. eSpace's payload consists of three demonstration satellites to validate the systems and, te and technology for its sustainable satellite system. The satellites can automatically deorbit if any system malfunctions occur, keeping space nice and clean. We should hear confirmation of a successful deployment soon. So yeah, you know, this will be great data for them going forward no matter what. Uh, obviously, don't risk a life to catch uh, a million or two million dollar piece of space hardware. Never <laughs> worth it, obviously. Uh, that should be obvious. I shouldn't even have to say that. But um, yeah, that's that's pretty cool that they were able to catch it and at least demonstrate they can rendezvous and, and snag it. Hopefully, they figure out why the flight characteristics weren't quite right once catching it. 
and just make it more and more reliable uh, in the future. E e space payload deployment is successful. There you go. Payload deployment is successful for eSpace. We hope you enjoyed the ride. Up next for deployment from Electron's Kickstage, we have some Space Bees from Internet of... And there they go. Payload deployment for Swarm successful there from the Kickstage. So next we will have the wow, Bro6 satellite for our friends at Unseen Labs. This is the sixth in its constellation and the third launch rocket lab has provided for Unseen Labs to expand it. Let's listen in for that confirmation. That's awesome. Thank you for listening, Hangtime Central. I appreciate uh, you listening to my music as well. Uh, don't forget, I do actually have some new music up. Uh, under the album name Heliocentric. So look up Everyday Astronaut on anything you're listening to or any, wherever you listen to music. Uh, I did have deployment successful. Sweet. Another successful deployment. Deployment. That's what we like to hear. Bro6 has successfully separated from the kick stage. We're now almost at the halfway point of today's deployments. Now we are listening out for the call that Aurora Sat 1 has been deployed. This satellite is also known as the Flying Object, which, while it sounds mysterious, will be doing the good deed of demonstrating space junk removal technologies for small satellites, including propulsion devices and plasma brakes that enable the sustainable use of space. <laughs> I might beat Ben Solons this year. We will see. We will see. <laughs> Thanks, Brian. I appreciate that very much. Um, Nick, how much is saved from catching versus landing? Well, Aurora Sat 1 deployment successful. Awesome. Everything's going smoothly on the deployments. So, um, yeah, so how much is saved from catching? So, unless you're doing propulsive landing and accurate, uh, you know, pinpoint landing, uh, you know, you, you have to basically catch it before it lands in the ocean, right? Otherwise, once it lands in the ocean, it's probably not going to be too good to refly. So, um, in this case, catching versus landing is. Uh, saving, uh, you're saving all of it. You're saving the entire booster if you're catching it. Um, they don't really have the option of landing electronics. Just, there aren't, uh, there really aren't the, the payload cap capacity for that. Huge thank you to Renau. Th Renau, you've been around for so long. Thank you so much. And this, honestly, I have to say, this sentiment means a lot to me. Um, while I may wish for more videos, I prefer the more in-depth videos you've been doing lately. Keep up the great work, Tim and team. Um, now, I promised I'll never do a video as hard as the Soviet rocket history video, but lately we have been producing what are my favorite videos to date by far. I think they're great videos for anyone, including, I, again, I learned a lot from these videos when I'm making them, even these newest ones that seem like kind of beginner videos, but I wanna go as deep as I can so that you don't have questions at the end of the videos. And um, I'm really just excited about, about these videos that we've been making lately. So um, thank you so much for now. That, that really, really means an insane amount. So um, everyone say thank you for now. Renau has been around for a long time, a uh, big supporter, and this just truly means the world. So stand by, there's gonna be a lot of fun content coming out. Um, and some stuff that's not normal for the channel. You'll see. Everything's deploying very successfully. Sorry, I'm I'm listening. They're under the last one right now. I'll, I will let you guys know. Um, Oh, awesome. Thank you so much for owning <laughs> an, uh, an aerospace shirt. That really means a lot. From uh, Sri Hari uh, Menon says, can you re-explain how they actually caught the booster? So hopefully I explained it. I explained it a few minutes ago, but I'll do it one more time. Um, oh, actually. Thank you, as always, to our fantastic mission partners. It is an honor and a privilege to deliver your spacecraft to orbit. Thank you to our incredible team who made today's mission possible and a huge congratulations again to our recovery team for another step forward in the recovery program today. To find out more about what's next in that program and to stay up to date on upcoming missions, follow us across our social media platforms. So thank you again for joining us for this webcast. We'll see you back here soon for our next launch, taking us a bit further than usual, coming up very soon. This is Rocket Lab Mission Control signing off. I'm really, really, um Really excited for that next the capstone mission will be amazing. So, all right, let me let me go through a handful of these here for you guys. We have a lot to talk about. I feel like um, let me let me just go like this. I'm actually going to remove the overlay. Um, yeah, 
So again, thank you guys for watching along with me. It really does mean the world to me. We've got a handful of more, a handful full more questions to answer. I don't know how to say that sentence at all. <clears throat> and then, uh, then I'm going to get out of here to get us fed. So uh, again, thank you so much for all of those that, of you that, that have been watching with me today. So um, let me get kind of things pulled up here so we can make sure everything's good to go. All right, let me answer a few more questions. Um, so uh, re-explaining and catching the booster again. So the booster, once it, once it re-enters the atmosphere um, and gets down to a slow enough speed, they deploy the parachute. The parachute is, uh, they first deploy a drogue chute and then the main parachute, which is a, a circular parachute, but it actually has some kind of vents in one side of it. So it makes it so it will automatically kind of fall in a certain direction, which then makes it so the drogue chute comes out uh, behind it. So between the main chute and the drogue chute, there's a rope. So that rope is, is basically out there falling from the sky horizontally, right? Now the helicopter has a line, a big rope line that is vertical with a hook on the end of it. And all they have to do is they have to run those two ropes into each other basically, right? So the helicopter pilot just has to go and make that, that line that he's dragging or that they're dragging below them uh, run into the helicopter's chute line, the, the, that line there. And then uh, once those two ropes are together and as, as the helicopter continues to fly forward, that eventually that hook will grab onto that rope, then that rope will eventually slack out until it hits the drogue chute, and then at that point, all of the load will be underneath the helicopter. So, yeah. Um, thank you so much from Zach A. I appreciate it. Uh, thank you for the membership from Mike Kretsch. Uh, Kretsch? Kretsch? Sure. Thank you, Mike. Uh, from Angus saying Rocket Lab Helicopter is the number two tracked aircraft in the world right now on Flight Radar 24. That's awesome. It's so cool to see that many enthusiasts tracking it. That's so cool. Um, Zach A, sorry I came late. How is the helicopter involved? Hopefully you just heard me explain it. Um, thank you very much, Zach. Uh, Simon, thank you so much. Kevin, thank you for becoming a member. Um, from Cheers GXP, thank you for the lemon character. Uh, Hamster Space Nerd 3000, hoping a cat jumped on screen and that caused the awe. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, that doesn't, doesn't seem to be the case, but it still was uh, a great mission nonetheless. Um, Arvid Nilsson says, who, thank you, Arvid, for always being around. Uh, there must always be a close but failed attempt first for the blooper reel. Uh, they will get it next time for sure. I agree. I definitely agree. Uh, Zach Baker from New Zealand here t uh, to clear confusion about the helicopter during the recovery of, and launch. Uh, uh, recovery uh, during the launch and whether the no-fly zone would apply. The helicopter is near me in Christchurch where the launch was 500, to, uh, air, 500 miles or 800 kilometers away approximately. Good call. Um, this is from, um, I'm sorry, I I'm, I'm, would definitely totally slaughter your name, um, but great stream, Tim. Glad to see you streaming. What, uh, re what resources do you use to learn about rocket science? Um, honestly, uh, a lot of it lately is just talking to people, <laughs> talking to actual engineers. Um, I think the last video I spent about 20 hours on phone calls with different engineers uh, that helped me understand different things. So um, that's been a great resource is having an engineer, having engineer friends. Um, but honestly, like Wikipedia can be a good starting point. Um, but, f but, you know, looking at the resources or the sources in a lot of the articles, uh, I use Wikipedia sometimes just to organize thoughts. Like I'll make tabs of Wikipedia things and then I'll use that to like go and find sources. I know it's, it's weird and dumb. Uh, but there's also, what is it, like academia.google.com or whatever. You can search academic papers, uh, which is fantastic. So, um, yeah, it's just kind of a handful of things. Um, NASA, you know, NASA has published a ton of stuff for public consumption uh, throughout the years. So a lot of the stuff that I cover is, is totally public domain. So, yeah. Uh, John, they should use remote control airfoils on a hook. So they did originally use airfoils at first, um, but... Uh, for whatever reason, they switched to a, a, a ring parachute. I guess it has a slower descent rate, can stay actually up in the air longer than a parafoil or an airfoil. Wait, is a parafoil an airfoil? Is that more like um, what Gemini was going to be using with like the... Uh, I, I, I guess I don't know. Sorry. Um, but they've looked at a lot of different things. I, of course, want them to just get like a handful of really large uh, drones, basically. I think that'd be really cool. Um, well, thank you very much from Joe from the UK. I appreciate that. Uh, Evo, thank you for the membership. And Daniel, thank you for the membership. And again, remember, members, you guys will be, uh, you'll, you will be the first to see any new content, as always. It's not some kind of paywall, but we use members, YouTube members, and Patreon supporters um, as the people that watch videos first to make sure there aren't any errors, to catch any errors. So 
Um, yeah, so that being said, get ready. The You, you members and, and Patreon supporters and stuff will get the first, you'll get to go through the first watches of the Elon interviews, the upcoming Elon interviews, and help catch errors, see if I have any glitches or anything like that, or give general feedback about the, the content as well. So, yeah. Um, so thank you for all of you that are members. Uh, again, from Joe, thank you. It looks like a little double tip. I appreciate that. Um, uh, Cole says... You changed my life, left Y in the Discord group. Okay, I better find this. I love hearing people's stories. I really appreciate that. Um, if someone can point me to that comment, I would like to, to read that. I, I, that's, that stuff really matters to me. Um, uh, <laughs> wait, this is what I meant. I, I, was this, I was the super chat. You changed my life. Please see this. I see this. Wait. What am I missing? I don't know. Repeat it, and I'll and I'll, and I'll read it. Uh, and one last one. Uh, oh, here we go. Hold on. Let's see. I'm going to read this real quick from uh, from Cole, who is in our Discord channel. Hey, Tim. Been watching your channel for three years, as I am a space enthusiast. After your brilliant videos educating me on space engineering and being able to share my excitement with you and the rest of your community on streams has been awesome. And a week ago... It landed me a brilliant job at Airbus. That is amazing. Uh, while I will be building satellites for the uh, where where I will be building satellites for the future of space exploration. Uh, thank you for everything you have done for me, and God knows how many other people who you have helped. Thank you so much, Cole. That yes, that's what I'm talking about. That is that is what I'm talking about. That is literally the point of Everyday Astronaut is to just. Make this stuff exciting, fun, and even though it can be really complicated topics, you know, really complicated things that, that you know, people used to get scared of watching, you know, making an eight minute long YouTube video because it could get too boring, right? Like who's gonna watch a video about uh, the enthalpy equation in the full flow stage combustion cycle engine, right? But I have always believed as long as you like tell the right story, you can get people to some really, really in-depth topics. My friend who, one of the people who was an engineer that I was on the phone with, basically said, he goes, uh, Charlie Garcia is his name. He's an, a brilliant engineer, absolutely brilliant engineer. He basically goes, man, Tim, you basically just took like a semester's worth of thermodynamics and presented, presented it correctly in, in two minutes time. I'm like, he, this little section, he's like, that was impressive. So that does mean a ton to me. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for all of you too that, that just watch. I really appreciate it. Um, I, I think our, my emotions were probably very similar to yours. Uh, D pod dolphin. Uh, you probably saw um, my emotions on screen. Yes, it, I mean, that was just absolutely crazy, crazy, crazy stuff. So I'm gonna make sure I'm not missing any. I think I actually might be missing a few more. Uh, I might have to refresh this. I might be missing a couple super chats and new members. Um, if I did, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's for some reason not showing up here, but I, I did see that, um, like, oh man, a, a couple here from Gavin. I gotta get going, unfortunately. Though. I gotta get us fed, but we have new members from from Wayne Jr. and Wayne, another Wayne, and from uh, Gavin and Eric and um, DJ had, had a, a tip. Uh, Robert Maynard says, uh, "Catching a rocket with a helicopter seems as crazy to me as having a rocket land itself." So cool to see these companies trying to make space possible. I agree, 100%. Thank you so much, uh, Timothy Johnson, a new member. Um, yeah. All right. I think. I think that's uh, that's gonna do it for me. Um, I gotta get out of here again so I can get Andrew fed and 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 myself fed. Of course, it's not just Andrew. The, he's not the only one that needs that needs uh, fed. Uh, we both are human. But again, if you guys want to help support what I do, consider becoming a uh, consider shopping, getting some cool merch for yourself. EverydayAstronaut.com/shop. We have awesome, uh, you know, awesome collection, including the uh, Soviet rocket collection with the RD-171 shirt and the R7 shirt. Uh, these are currently out of stock, but they will be coming back really soon. We're actually updating these suits to be even more like the original space shuttle uh, spacesuit. They are awesome. They're going to be like 2.0. I can't wait for those. I can't wait for you guys to see them. Uh, they're going to be awesome. So yeah, of course, everydayastronaut.com slash shop. Shop around. Get some cool nerdy stuff. This shirt's also new. I don't think I've really Talked about this one too much. RS-25 sure This will be a really fun one. I'm going to wear this one for sure when SLS launches since it has four RS-25s. It'll be really fun. So, yeah, again, if you guys want to help me do what I do, everydayastronaut.com slash shop. Um, or, again, if you want to help me 
uh, by you can become a Patreon member or a YouTube member, and that stuff makes a huge difference. So, all right, love you guys. Thank you so much for tuning in. It was really fun streaming this with you. I cannot wait for Rocket Lab to try this again. Uh, I have no doubt they're going to learn a ton from this, and it's going to be awesome. So, thank you everybody, uh, including Rocket Lab. Congratulations on an awesome test. Can't wait to see you do it again. It's going to be great. That's going to do it for me. I'm Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut, bringing space down to Earth for everyday people. Goodbye, everybody.